AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization for people 50 plus, where our vision is for a society in which all people live with dignity and purpose and can fulfill their goals and dreams. In California, we are focused on developing livable communities for all ages. So to learn more about the work AARP is doing at the national, state, and local levels, visit aarp.org slash forward slash CA. Now, during this hip hop happy hour, we're ready to kick off our celebration of the 50th anniversary of hip hop as we prepare for an interactive series on the health, wellness, and cultural impact of hip hop in our society. From the foundational elements to where it is today compared to where it arrived on the scene 50-ish years ago, including how hip hop is currently being utilized in psychosocial therapy. This feeds right into an AARP study which brought attention to the significantly positive impact of music on brain and overall health and wellness. And our guide in this journey will be Dr. Jalil Abdul Adil, who is an Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology and Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and he is the co-director of the Urban Youth Trauma Center. He is also one of the originators and nationally renowned experts on the use of modern rap music and hip hop culture to enrich psychosocial interventions for urban youth. We encourage all of you to be active in the chat as we'll take questions towards the end of the session. And Dr. Abdul Ladil will also engage throughout the event as well. Now there are some meeting guidelines we would also like everyone to adhere to. Please keep yourself on mute. Make sure to keep your line muted. Use the chat to pose questions, answer questions and more. And be respectful of others on the call by using respectful language and tone. And so stepping up to the virtual mic right now is Dr. Jalil Abdul Adil. Welcome, Dr. Abdul Adil. Thank you so very much. I'm so excited to be here and have an opportunity to present to this very unique audience where we're gonna reach back, as they say, the old hip hop heads, those fans say we reach back, digging in the crates, going through our history and appreciating it. And I would like to now share the presentation and we'll dive right into it. Consistent with what has already been said, we're looking forward to an interactional presentation, really chopping it up as they say in the hip hop world. So please feel free to use the chat and I will insert questions throughout. I'll encourage you to share your thoughts, your opinions. Beautiful thing about art is there's no wrong answers, your answer. So we're gonna appreciate all the elements of rap and hip hop. And also there'll be some special questions of which you can win some unique AR, AARP prizes if you are one of the first ones to answer correctly. So at this point, let me share my screen. <clears throat> so we're kicking off this series and the first one of this three-part series that we'll be enjoying will be going over the music itself and the songs with a spotlight on the content and the experience. And this one is called Rap Music Errors and the All-Time Greats. I'm just going to share my screen for myself so I can see you all and enjoy everybody's right face as I go through this. This is also consistent with the theme that's in much of classical hip hop where we say, what time is it? Rap time. As a guide toward rap music, which is a beautifully complex musical culture that has spanned over 50 years as we know, we want to have some very basic understandings of what rap music is. So you can think about rap music from the classical era all the way to today with all its complexities at a foundational level. It's rhyming to the sequence of a sound beat while you're making your rhymes either at the end, in the middle, wordplay, 
metaphors, but we're taking a very basic framework so we have the most inclusive perspective on all the different types of rap that we want to enjoy. For those of you who've been rap fans for a long time, you know, it's changed a lot and there's certain elements which are still the same. And today we're going to take a quick tour and reflection back on those eras. I want to also acknowledge that rap today continues, although you will see it morphed into having R&B, rock, yeah, country elements. There's all different types. So we're reaching back into the crates to enjoy the classics. I hope that will bridge and inspire us to appreciate some of the positive elements of what's happening today, as we'll talk about during this series, how they can open up opportunities for us to not only be healthy physically, but also relationally and to connect to the other generations which are coming up on a very different type of rap, but they're common elements that we want to be able to connect with them. Now, when we talk about hip hop and hip hop culture, originally at the core, I'm a purist, I will acknowledge that there were five main elements which emerged from the boroughs and the Bronx. There was the rapper or the MC, there's a DJ, modern manifestations of producers, the people who are making the music, there's the graffiti art, similar to what was asked in the polls, there's the break dancing, which has morphed now into all types of dancing, line dancing, all types of hip hop elements which have been brought into that. And this is the one that most people forget or they bypass, which is beatboxing. And I'm here to tell you there are still international presentations. There are still international competitions with beatboxing. And I hope to show you a little bit of the young generation still trying to keep up those traditions. But those are the original five elements. Now. People say rap music or hip hop, are they synonymous? KRS-One, I saw somebody's from the Boogie Down Bronx, you probably could appreciate from the Boogie Down Productions. The teacher, KRS-One nickname said, rap is something you do, but hip hop is something you live. So they're complementary. In essence, you could think about hip hop being an entire culture of art, movement, um, even knowledge, politics, uh, youth energy and movement, elderly movement, right? It's, it's an encompassing culture which all celebrates and appreciates rap music as an element. So it's inclusive of rap music, but it's not the, it's not the full extent of it. Hip hop culture are all of those five elements which include the rap and, and the music, the videos and all of that, but it's so much more. So we think about rap is something you do. Anybody can rap with a little bit of talent or even if you don't have talent, you can rap. But hip hop culture is a way of approaching and looking at life in such a way you celebrate things like cultural pride, self-affirmation and all the other important parts that make a healthy life for us. And we wanted to bring in someone to co-sign what I just said. So we're going to play a little bit of a clip that was written by one of our contemporary MCs, though he's mature and reflects a lot of that old school sensibilities, Black Thought. And what he did is composed a love letter to rap and hip hop. I'm gonna just play this and there's no better example of an appreciation for hip hop and all its elements than what Black Thought has put together. Clever wordplay, great cultural affirmation. So I'll play a little bit here and you all please let me know if you do not hear the sound. I think we just had a
very powerful and comprehensive, entertaining. And now I'd like you all to use the chat. Put in there your reaction. Something you heard, an image that caught your eye, a feeling you had when you were listening or watching. And we're going to keep that in mind, how the music moves us. And I intentionally took someone who could give us that across the ages to set the tone while also showing that the spoken word with and without the music, with talent, can be so inspirational. And rap today has kind of expanded to accept and embrace even the spoken word as performance art under the fabric of rap. And you can see that aesthetic, the content, the delivery, that was very hip hop, yet you didn't hear any soundtrack. And that type of flexible thinking get, keeps us fresh also in our appreciation for how these younger generations are continuing to advance and develop at least certain segments, are continuing to advance and develop the culture in a way we could stay connected and still enjoy. So now the Grammys, amongst others, have said they have the 50 years of hip hop. Now we're going to have the AARP celebration out of 50 years of hip hop. Now, the difference is, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to just go ahead and say this out loud, y'all, because I try to keep it real. AARP says, I've known them have always been down, as we say, for embracing rap and hip hop. I can't say that about the Grammys. I was there and I was around when the Grammys refused to acknowledge it as a new musical genre, genre, it refused to televise things live. And actually, only today is it seeming like it's trying to rewrite history to embrace, like they've always been down and always been supportive of rap and hip hop, and that actually hasn't been the case. Why do I say that? Multiple, multiple reasons here. One, set the record straight, but secondly, especially to this audience, this is an opportunity for us to always protect the narratives, tell the truth about our history, especially in Black History Month, when we're dealing with Black music or anything else coming from cultural traditions, whether it's Black, Brown, Asian, whoever it may be, Native American, keep it real. Because we want to acknowledge the systemic struggle that has occurred inside and around this music as a microcosm and a teachable moment for perseverance, for resilience, for strengths, and all the other messages that our young people may not want to hear if we do it in a traditional lecture format. But if I say, hey, let me tell you a story about the Grammys and its relationship to hip hop and use that as a as a um, as a teachable moment, we can pass on a lot more of our knowledge. And this is our expertise. We know this music. We've lived this music. We've been around this music. So you can use these as entertaining teachable moments as Boogie Down Productions, KRS One also said is edutainment. Now, when we look, this is just a sample of the richness, diversity, and inspiration of so many artists. Tonight, I'm going to highlight just a few with the uh, few minutes that we have. I'm going to encourage all of us remember how we get excited, inspired how it's uplifting. And as we move through these eras, I'm going to stop a couple of times and ask you, please pop in the chat in each era. What music did you like? How did it make you feel? What positives do you take from those memories as you move forward in your life right now? So they said they're celebrating 50 years. I'm taking it back to the pre-birth date of rap pre-1973, and whether our young people always know it or not, and full disclosure, I don't think even we knew as much back then that we're drawing from the musical legacy that has been there, coming all the way from the spirituals during times of enslavement, where we were struggling, the Harlem Renaissance and what it did in terms of uplifting communities, the blues in terms of expressing things that still needed to be changed in a society. Even when you had Dewey Pigmeat Mark Markham, he used comedy with a, with a com comedic style to kind of set some of that cadence up. Don't forget about Muhammad Ali's spoken word style. I'll tell you, his, his spoken word is still being played by the young people and it's still engaging and it's still edutainment for what's going on in society. And here we have a picture of the last poets. And I remember I discovered the last poets, full disclosure, I discovered the last poets through who? N.W.A. 
with one of their earliest albums in the 90s where they did a remix of the famous Die In Die uh, uh, spoken word performance, The Last Poets. They inserted it into a song which in a gangster rap style exposed some of the contradictions of social injustice that many urban youth were still going through. So we can always learn when we're absorbing. I also, and full disclosure now, I, what am I, 58, okay? So I have no problem stepping to my young people, telling them, look, here's all the stuff you know, but look, here's all the stuff you don't know. Them samples you heard, hey, I had the record, right? I had the eight track. So you want to use that to kind of prompt them to engage with us in this musical culture, telling them things about the music they may already be attracted to and using that to slip in messages about social development, upliftment, and the other important parts of history so we have that real full framework. And you could put in the chat, if you can, if you remember, who was your pre-1973 artist? That could include folks who are coming out like the Black Arts Movement. I won't do a full roll call, but we know uh, uh, Amiri Baraka, uh, Sonia Sanchez. I'm going to go ahead and throw in uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and her cadence and inspirations with the Civil Rights Movement. I'm going to go ahead and throw in Maya Angelou. Just that whole uplifting word uh, play that they used to do that would educate a nation. So you could put in a chat who you and folks who are watching the chat with me on the AAR P team, please let me know uh, when we get ready to open up. We're going to look at some of the interesting things that you all have said. Now, moving on to the early 1970s, the early pioneers of both the music and the culture. This was also mentioned in Black Thought's performance. The early block parties, the early coming together of the different uh, neighborhoods, that was also a violence prevention movement. There were gangs that were in New York that had peace treaties. And to confirm those peace treaties, they used to have block parties where different gangs would go into different jurisdictions to prove and affirm that there was a truce and they were gonna come together and have fun. It also represented a resilient response to social injustice because many of these young people, including the young adults, they were not able to get into the high rolling, let's say uh, uh, Studio 54s, the discotheques, they weren't allowed in there because if you all remember, they used to pride themselves on turning even famous celebrities away at the door. So these young people, which I think includes some of us, depending on how old you are, right? They had a resilient response, a creative response that not only um, pulled together violence prevention and protection of life, but also mobilization of resources, creativity, and the establishment of a new an urban identity that was built on this creative musical genre. And you recognize uh, some of our pioneers here, uh, Grandmaster Flash, uh, Melly Mel, DJ Cool, Herc, and others. Now, some of us may not know all of that history, but most people know this history, which is in the late 1970s, 1979, rap and hip hop emerged from the underground from and beyond those anti-disco block parties into the mainstream music scene. You had people who were doing little snippets of it like in the late, late 1970s, Fatback Bands, King Tim Three. Uh, you, then you had Sugar Hill Gang. And that's with Sylvia Robinson, which we want to give props out to this pioneering African-American female who had a vision to bring this rap to vinyl and to the mainstream. And in 1979, the Sugar Hill Gang released the song Rapper's Delight that became the first official national rap record release. Backstory as we know, the lyrics were stolen. Okay, this was a thrown together band, but Sylvia Robinson and her vision knew she wanted to market this as a, as a creative uh, genre, which was gonna push forth and, and push the boundaries of the music scene. And there was something special about that music even if there wasn't something special about these three performers. So Rapper's Delight was the one that popularized this new musical genre to a national audience. And if you can remember, you could go ahead and put in the chat. There were a few others who were coming up, but Rapper's Delight was the main one which really set the bar in terms of the publicity across the nation. If you think of some 1970s artists that you enjoy, go ahead and put them in the chat. It'll be a nice reflection for all of us. Then came the early 1980s and run DMC. 
Now, Run DMC took it to another level because they leveraged all of those elements of hip hop. They had dance, they had the art, they had the fashion, which is the physical representation of the hip hop cultural art. You see, they had the Kangos, um, they had the Adidas, they had the big chains, and they used to go almost right from the block to performance, right? They were bringing urban culture into the mainstream and it actually went not only national, it went international and they became icons. I'll suggest to you, they're still icons today. We've lost one of them through tragedy, but this is still an iconic group. They broke down main, the mainstream doors into the music video culture. And people will say, and if you remember in the mid 1980s, it was actually Run DMC which stepped in when rap started to lose some of its early momentum. They are the ones who paired in a very creative way with Aerosmith, which was an outgrowth of their King of Rock motif of using all the different type of albums. This is also from their DJ Jam Master J, using different musical genres. So when we see young people today using rap with country, using rap with jazz, that's nothing new. That's actually a reflection of the same history. Great conversation to have with your young people. And they were performing to stadiums. They were doing rap rock collaborations. And actually when they did Walk This Way with Aerosmith, that didn't just launch them, that actually revived Aerosmith's career at the time when they were falling um, out of favor. Then we move on also to another early 1980s group. And you can see here, the wardrobes reflect a lot of the disco culture, but they still were keeping it real with the, with the urban music right out of the you know block parties and the boom boxes. This is Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. They made a seminal song that was a con confirmation of the legacy of the last poets, but really became the first rap conscious political, social political commentary called The Message. And I challenge people and I use it sometimes with young people. I'll go back and play all those lyrics and say, what's changed? Does this still resonate with you? Are you still saying the same things just with a different style or using drill style or using, you know, trap style? But this is the same thing because they put a social political commentary on what was going on. It moved over the party scene that really was dominant at that time. And we enjoy the party scene, right? But it moved it over and said, there's a time to be serious. There's a time to be sober. And there's a time to call for social justice. Then in the late 1980s, we had somebody who took that social justice up to another level. The political commentary crystallized and actually peaked with pro-black conscious rap groups like Public Enemy, whose fight to power is still popular. And it showed the integration of community issues in movies that became that started to partner with the music like Do the Right Thing. And it amplified the media messages with music videos and movie soundtracks. Very happy about this positive development. I have to also clear some space for something happening out on the other coast, which is the coast many of you are on. At the same time, you had the rise of what was first called reality rap. It wasn't gangster rap. It was first called reality rap by the mainstream media. Then it became known as gangster rap after that. And there was a groundbreaking group, no surprise to any of us who, who follow the history of NWA. They did expose many negative behaviors, but they also put commentary on some of the harsh conditions that some of our young people were struggling with and are still struggling with to this day. They were one of the forerunners of the calls against police brutality, even though they put it in a harsh, you know, harsh words. Okay, and they were very profane in how they were commenting or it resonated with people who felt that anger at the injustices. And so there's a time to have the message, public enemy. There's also a time when some of the people we have to work with, some of our own experiences, we have to say it in a harsh and uncut way to get it expressed so we can get it in our awareness and then we can process it in a more pro-social and productive manner. And of course, as we're going through the 80s, and please feel free, put your favorite artists of the 80s in the chat. You know, there's a whole bunch of them starting to come out now, you see. And I can only show so many. So you see, I couldn't even put Eric B and Rakim and some of the other X-Clan and others. But I want to, before I leave the 80s, I want to stop and give a special shout out 
to this person who has expanded so much beyond her original rap career, but still remains one of my favorite, most talented performers. Who is that? The Queen. As her album said, all hail the Queen. Queen Latifah. And in the early 1990s was when women in rap, feminist rap, womanist rap, was officially stamped. And I think Queen Latifah best captured that pro-social, positive, culturally conscious way of approaching things. And her song, Ladies First, I'll suggest to you, is timeless and is still relevant. I still use that when I'm dealing with some of my uh, 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 young women, uh, adolescents, and, and adults in some of these groups. She brought together Afrocentricism. I also want to note here before I leave, she was also an entrepreneur. Okay, she put on Flavor Unit, which launched the careers of people like Naughty by Nature and others. She was one of the ones early on, hear me, early on talking about pay equity for female performers. And she was one of the ones along with MC Light, Moni Love, and um, a couple of others who pushed the envelope to say we need more safe, respectful space for the sisters who are in rap. Now, moving on to the mid-1990s, that's best captured by the bi-coastal movements and unfortunately the beefs between two talented artists here, Biggie and Tupac, who we both tragically lost to gun violence and youth conflicts. Now, if I really wanted to burn up the rest of the time, I could open up a debate about who was better. But I won't do that. I'll, I'll let that. We'll, we'll get to that maybe at some other point. You can put in the chat who you, who you think was better. Now, personal leanings, I'll say who was the most impactful? Tupac, who might have had the best flow? Maybe Biggie. But see, the beauty of the art is I don't have to choose. I can enjoy both. And I can enjoy one without having to knock down the other to justify. This is these are teachable moments also in society we should share, right? I'm always I'm always hinting about edutainment as we go through this. Now, these life lessons that still resonate from both of these performers are things that I think really set the stage for the 1990s. Uh, the beef, which was, was the dangers of conflict, as well as the artistry. And I definitely don't want to leave the 90s without talking about a late 1990s icon, Miss Lauren Hill. She built off the Queen's legacy. And I, I want to definitely give her a shout out because she brought hip hop to a wider audience across multiple genres. She also did it on her own after breaking away from the Fugees. And she won many awards with her consciousness, her personal class, and her independence. And so I want y'all to think positive about Lauren Hill. Uh, I won't talk about how she don't show up to her concerts on time on a quiet tip. Uh, we won't bring that up today. Okay. We're just going to say we're going to appreciate Lauren Hill and we hope that, that you know, she continues to perform and punctually because it, what time is it? <laughs> now, moving forward into the early 2000s, you see a repeat performer as well as a new performer. Early 2000s, the new millennium saw both a revival and the birth of the legendary Dr. Dre from his NWA days, combined it with Eminem, they both helped launch 50 Cent, which then launched the game, G-Unit, and a number of other hits. 50 Cent even took it up to another consumer corporate level by leveraging his success in sneakers, clothes, drinks. Now he's enjoying, which I am a fan of, his new Power TV series, book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. I love all of that, right? Very, very powerful. Um, and became one of the few rap billionaires, right? Put in the chat, what are some of your early 2000 hits? What are some of the music that resonated with you? Hopefully you still were following the songs. Or um, you might have got stuck on the beauty of the classical era. But if some 2000 era artist grew on you, pop their name in the chat. And you see somebody I'm not mentioning is Lil Wayne. Now, why would I? Some people say, oh, that was one of the best artists of the early 2000s. That's my own quirk, right? And and there's some things about Wayne, I think, that, well, I won't put him on blast on here. Uh, we, we, we hope our young people continue to mature, right? But I won't deny his talent. I won't deny his talent. And I won't deny 
that because of his work, there's some contemporary artists I'll mention soon um, that actually got to start their careers. We're talking about forgiving people for things. We move it on to the late 2000s. The popularity, the exposure, and the entrepreneurship, both of these stars took up to another level. Jay-Z and his sign, signee Kanye West. They joined the billionaire status of Dr. Dre recently. And yes, there's another unmentioned P. Diddy artist who reached a financial success but has brought struggles. These are teachable moments for all of us to think about. There's, there's things that we are, have strengths. We're still accountable. And there are things that if we make mistakes, we're going to have blowback. We're going to be held accountable by communities for what we do. Now, you could go back and celebrate some of P. Diddy's stuff, but I'm not going to pretend that's not something that has come with some baggage. So when we're working with youth, also we advise, you can select artists to talk about. They don't all have to be perfect because no human is perfect, but you can point out the problems as teachable moments without dismissing entirely the whole music. We've ha I had a recent conversation with folks who's like, uh, one of the older folks in our generation said, I don't want to hear anything about Kanye West anymore. I don't want to hear anything about P. Diddy anymore. And I said, no, I think what the, the issue is if, if they're, young people who like it, I say, I don't want to hear it without a comment. And I want to talk about what, and after we talk about this, do you still want to listen to that? But you listen to it alert and aware. Moving on now to the early 2010s, we have Drake, right? All over the place, right? Basketball arenas and sports events too, all right? And Drake was actually put on by Lil Wayne. So again, I'm going to give him some credit. He took it up to another level of pop. Now, there is a very interesting debate going on right now, which we don't have to have here, but you could go out and Google it, uh, that he's having with most death about um, what's hip hop versus what's hip hop or pop music. And most death is saying that the purest of the consciousness and the unique aesthetic of rap and hip hop from the early days is something that needs to be protected. You could creatively expand it, but stick with that aesthetic versus just trying to sell a lot of records by, in his opinion, watering down things like Drake does. I There's a big debate we can have about that again. And we actually, we could talk about this, you know, maybe maybe in the future before this series is over. I'm pointing out as a as an elder, I have to respect the fact that this artist has a following. I want to see, are there any songs that I might enjoy? And there are a couple, right? I actually like the beat for back to back, right? <laughs> there, there are certain things I like, but I don't have to uh, put him up against Public Enemy or join in with Most Def attacking. I want to appreciate the overall culture because that keeps me in a lot more conversations. And on that pop vibe, we'll move on now to the late 2010s. Can't talk about Drake without talking about Nicki Minaj. And she took it up to another level on the commercial side of the female artist. Now she's talented too. Right. Just she's talented, too. Um, but she also has a cultural weight. I won't say she's at the level of a Beyonce, but inside hip hop, she has a cultural weight right along with Cardi B that we want to pay attention to. Now, you didn't hear this from me, but I, somebody might say, you know what? Me as a rap old hip hop head. Nicki Minaj basically rebranded little Kim's act. You didn't hear that from me. But for the young people. They really enjoy Nicki Minaj. And see, I won't put one against the other. And I know sometimes those hip hoppers uh, uh, have beef. But I think we should allow these young people to grow and rebrand and recreate and revive some of the classics. So you could put in the chat who are some of your favorite artists from the 2010s. Hey, Kevin. I'm going to come with Too Quickly. Uh, this is the early 2020s coming up through the present. This is one of the up and coming artists who's now a Grammy Award winner called Little Dirk from Chicago. Uh, I'll get to him in a future series, probably in week three. We'll talk about how these young people can turn their life around with the assistance of the elders, including the big turnaround he's making with the help of his father. And that's very important, our particular roles. I'll also talk about Kendrick Lamar, who is one of the older, newer artists and He's someone who blazed uh, blaze some trails. He's also put on new artists like uh, Baby Kim. He did that wonderful soundtrack to Black Panther, and he was the first rapper recognized with a prestigious Pulitzer Prize for poetry, of which rap is poetry, 
over sounds. So you could put in the chat, do you have any artists that you like right now? Any that come to mind? At this point, we're going to go to our quiz. And if we have time, we're going to uh, play a brief clip just to round things off. So everybody get ready for the hip hop quiz. You didn't think you'd be in school this time of night, but we are. Right. For those of you not in school, we coming back to school. So here's a quiz. Do you remember something which has been said? Do you remember? And the first people to answer will be rewarded with a nice, unique AARP prize. Question one, please put in the chat. First three people to respond correctly get the chance to win a wonderful prize of this unique AARP fan. What did KRS once say is the difference between rap music and hip hop culture? First three will win. What did KRS once say is the difference between rap music and hip hop culture? And the AARP team can keep track. Uh, I'm going to go to our second question, unless you all want to, um, unless you all wanted to stop here. I, I'm thinking that we'll, because uh, of time, we'll just keep going to the second question and maybe we'll review uh, who won. Uh, we get toward the end. Okay, good. Thank you, Antoine. And now question two. All right, so I know everybody's alert. Okay, so you ready? We, we got another great prize coming up. So question two, first three people to respond correctly get this wonderful prize of a unique AARP tote bag. What was the rap song that first popularized this new musical genre to a national audience? The rap song that first popularized this new musical genre to a national audience. And if you were alert throughout, you heard me say both of these. <clears throat> so I'm looking at my time now. I think we're just about out of time. We didn't want to stop without playing a few clips just to, uh, you know, uh, let's say reboot and refresh ourselves on some of the sounds. I'm just going to play brief clips and I can share the links later. We're going to go through the ages real quick. So we're going to go back to, yes, one of my favorites, Queen Latifah, All Hail the Queen. And we're just going to play like another a minute or two just to get us going. Great images. Okay. So we went all the way back to early 90s. Now we're going to step forward with a twist. Look how the young people are rediscovering and refashioning some of the hits that we grew up with. This is Run DMC, but with young people performing to it with a twist. Okay, just wanted to give you a little sample of that and look how the young people are actually paying tribute and appreciating these pioneers. And you see some health benefits of the dancing. So there's a lot there. I want to conclude with one of my favorites that really one of the first hits that really showed me the positive potential of rap music. And that's a rebranding of the famous Fight the Power by Public Enemy. We'll just pay a couple of minutes of this and then we'll uh, wind up. Okay, just giving you a little sample of that. And I'm encouraging you for those who haven't seen this video, you should watch it all the way through because this rapper right here is my favorite female MC of the modern era called Rhapsody. Very powerful, um, very positive, very political. Um, so uh, you might want to check that out, put that on your playlist. <clears throat> I know we're coming down to the time when we need to uh, open it up. So I'll just say very quickly, since 1973 all the way to 2023, now 2024, this is a 50-year phenomenon, phenomenon. We just gave a very brief review. Rap music can make you laugh, cry, smile, cringe, regret, appreciate, and all the other aspects of life. That's why many of us still listen to it and respond to it so passionately, whether they're classic cuts, contemporary creations, or even our own songs and poetry that we make ourselves. So over the next couple of weeks, We'll start going through other aspects and benefits of rap music and hip hop culture. I'm going to turn it over to the AARP team. I'm going to say a homework for you all, if you want. You can go look up this video, which is called KRS-One's 50 More Years of Hip Hop. And he, as Black Thought did the reflection backward, KRS gives a projection forward of how rap music and hip hop culture can continue to be beneficial. Uh, and now we'll stop there and I will turn the mic over to 
the facilitator who, if we have time for some questions or comments, we'll do so. We do. Oh, that was phenomenal, Dr. Abdul Adil. Oh, that I, I learned a lot. Um, one of the things that you had asked who had the first question was rap is something you do, hip hop is something you live. Correct? Incorrect? Correct. For the prize? Correct. Okay. And okay, hold on. Okay. So I have do have a couple of questions that I need to ask. Um, we're going to get bring these questions and comments from you from all of you to Dr. Abdul Adil from the chat, queued up our staff. And one of the questions is, how can I develop a deeper appreciation for hip hop? I think one way I would encourage is to keep an open mind <laughs> because it looks very different today. There are certain similarities that look like they coming from the classical era, especially as they kind of rebrand and revive that like you saw from a couple of cuts I brought. But I would also keep an open mind to some different ways of rhyming, some different musical textures and dive in. Um, if you don't have a whole lot of time, I can recommend probably starting with a web page called Genius, which gives you not only the latest songs, but it also gives you the lyrics and backstories and videos all in one place. You can also join up to some of the free, repeat, free newsletters, which will be sent to you by email coming from places like Complex, Hip Hop DX, um, XXL, The Source, uh, BET. These are uh, uh, easily accessible sources to, to scan through and see what you like. And I suggest if you take the structure we discussed of the hip hop cultural elements and approach what's going on with youth musical media with an open mind, you probably will find at least a couple artists who you think they're saying something positive. Uh, the the uh, production and the sounds and the beats are things that you may like, or at least you like to listen to them sometimes. I think there's a lot more diversity with rap and hip hop than we might see in the sensationalist headlines just in the mainstream newspapers. And, and come back next week because we're going to talk about the health benefits of all of these elements, which apply to all of us. Yeah. Uh, another question that we have for you, Dr. Abdul Adil, is what are some parts of society and American culture that have been impacted by hip hop beyond music? I want to say everywhere. I mean, seriously. And, and I'll take us through the elements um, in a future uh, presentation, but just a, just a sample, look at the Super Bowl. <laughs> look at the Super Bowl halftime shows. Look at sports, right? They're all, the, the joke is all the athletes want to be rappers, all the rappers think they're athletes, right? So it's, it's all there. It's impacted movies. It's impacted television. It's impacted uh, 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 the, the podcast. It's impacted all aspects of social media. It's impacted clothing styles. It's impacted language. It's actually impacted even academics and scholarship because there are classes on rap and hip hop in the most prestigious institutions throughout, not just the country, but the world. It's also gone international. I, I mean, we just scratched the surface here with some US English language rappers, but I have personally done research on rappers everywhere from China, Japan, um, Germany, uh, Bolivia, Panama, uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, it goes out saying Canada, it, it's everywhere. So really it's just looking for that aesthetic of that style of speaking, dressing, um, the, the texture of the music. And, and I'll say real quickly also, the music it has more influence than those that are just called rap songs because a lot of the producers are producing pop songs. They're, Beyonce just released a country song and she's carrying forth that kind of hip hop aesthetic. So you'll see it everywhere, literally. Yeah, I didn't even mention video games. So what is the official birth date of hip hop, would you say? I know you went through all those. So I'll say the official mainstream 
uh, recognized birth date can be 1973. Yeah. That's when they kind of point to that those cultural elements coming together around the Bronx. I say 1979 is when many people first got their listen to what rap is through Rapper's Delight. But me as a personal musical historian and hip hop head, I have to go back before 1973 to the last poets, the Sonia Sanchez, um, to the black arts movement and the poets like um, Amiri Baraka, uh, I'll take some things out of even what was done in jazz. So their elements were there before. It kind of crystallized into one central musical culture up in 1973 in New York. Um, even though before 1973, the, the, the gang truces, they were already doing block parties and building gang, gang peace alliances. And they were dancing and having parties. I think people just recognize it at another level in 1973. Things are on a continuum, you know, not one day rap came. It's like, no, it's like it emerged. Okay. A couple quick more questions. Um, how would you define hip hop to a novice, someone who knows nothing really about the genre? How would I define them? Mm -hmm. I would say if you're a fan and you can appreciate even one element or one song, then you're a hip hop hit. Now, hip hop head really means you know all this. You don't have to be giving presentations like I'm doing. If you appreciate and can embrace the songs, the lyrics, the meanings, the young people, that's young, youth, you know, adolescents, young adults, and even people like us who may still follow it, if you're supportive of the expression of those voices, if you open space in your life and your job and in your circles to elevate what the young people are saying and try to affirm and support them, I'll say you're, you're a hip hop fan. You may not be a hip hop head. You, know, you can go back all the history and all that, but you can dive right in. And a good thing, and this is reflective of, of when hip hop first started, hip hop is a very inclusive culture. There were multiracial, multi socioeconomic groups that came together around hip hop and they all appreciated and respected each other. And I think you're still seeing that. So ju I just say, just dive right in. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Adil. This is, this has really been wonderful. Did you, you have any final remarks? I just want to thank everybody for allowing me into your homes this early evening for you all, late evening for me. And I look forward to seeing you back when we go through the other aspects. Wonderful. So before we bring up our final poll of the night, do you have um we want to say that remind you that this is the first of our three-part series. And we hope that you all are coming back to learn even more. So we're going to bring up a closing poll now that you have a familiar poll for you to take to close out the night. What is the fundamental foundational element of hip hop? Is it graffiti art? Is it acting? Is it style or is it attitude? Now let's see what you say this time. Okay. It looks like uh, acting just isn't getting any play. So graffiti art is 14%, attitude 57%, and style 29%. Thank you all very much for participating in the poll. And graffiti art is the answer. So don't forget to visit us at www.aarp.org forward slash CA to register for session number two and number three of this series taking place February 22nd and February 29th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. We will learn so much more. And to access our events calendar and to learn about other activities. So thank you everyone who joined us today. Thank everyone behind the scenes of this session. Vince King, Sarita Cardoza, Marissa Guzardo, and Antoine Kick. And my name is Jacqueline Cole, and we do hope you enjoyed this session. From all the comments that I see in the chat, I think everyone had a wonderful time. Please be on the lookout for a survey coming to you via email.